Uh, my name is Hamed Hosseini, senior, senior lecturer in sociology, University of Newcastle. I wish to welcome you all to today's event and express my warmest gratitude to Professor Marcus Foth from uh, QUT for offering a seminar presentation and a master class today on a smart cities. Thank you all for attending the event. I wish you all a rewarding and exciting experience. Um, let me start with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land um, Pambalan clan of um, Abu Bakal nation, where our campus is located and pay respect to their elder, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play in our societies. This event is offered by Professor Fath from Queensland University of Technology and is the very first seminar hosted and organized by Alternative Future Research Network, one of the strategic networks of the Faculty of Education and Arts at UON, sponsored by the Association for Computing Machinery and a School of Humanities and Social Sciences and also supported by NINA, New Economy Network Australia and, Center for, and the Center for 21st Century Humanities located at UN. To give you a very brief background, our Alternative Future Research Network studies and promotes alternative modes of development beyond carbon, um, capital, consumerism and unsustainable growth. Uh, with a focus on the prospects of inclusive um, development in Australian regional areas. NINA, a new economy network Australia, is a network of individuals and organizations working to transform Australia's economic system so that the achieving ecological health and social justice are the foundational principles and primary objectives of the economic system. Alternative Future Research Network and NINA have recently signed an uh, MOU to create Alternative Futures Research and Engagement Hub as the very first community partnered participatory research hub at UN. The hub aims to one, create a common platform for promoting conversation, convergence, collaboration, coalition, and integration among various transformative forces and visions. Two, co-create a knowledge commons of, of alternatives through exploring, mapping, comparing, examining uh, alternative modes of livelihood, governance, and sociability that transcend capitalist relations and the current crisis-prone dependence on uh, carbon, consumerism, corruptive politics, and compulsive growth. Uh, more details about this endeavor can be uh, found at the UN website and also the Common Alternatives website. Marcus is a professor of urban informatics in the uh, QUT Design Lab, um, Creative Industries faculty at Queensland University of Technology. Professor Fath's research brings together people, place, and technology. His transdisciplinary work is at the international forefront of human computer interaction, research, and development with a focus on smart cities, community engagement, media architecture, internet studies. Uh, ubiquitous computing and sustainability. Professor Fath founded the Urban Informatics Research Lab in 2006 and the QUT Design Lab in 2006. Uh, please join me to welcome uh, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you all for making the time, and so that I'm all wired up to um, speak to you through um, a microphone. But I think we'll um, get this now going. Does that sound all right to you? OK, great. Um, I got a bit of a storytelling exercise for us. So I'm going through a bit of background, um, how our research group has developed, where it came from. And also, I'm going to share with you some of the internal, I suppose, thoughts and um, struggles that we are currently experiencing. And I'm actually inviting you um, as part of um, this lecture, and maybe also if you've got the time as part of the master class this afternoon, to help us um, crowdsource some of the potential solutions and way forwards with regards to what we might do about some of these struggles, issues, and challenges that we've um, started to identify. So the um, overall topic is smart cities, but you will see that uh, my take on smart cities is um, a little bit different to what you might read in the media or in industry white papers. And um, I still use it though because obviously it has a lot of um, currency and a lot of um, significance out there in government and industry. And so it does connect to wider debates, which is um, I think a useful thing to, to do. But I also try and um, connect it to 
um, some of the theories that we've been engaging with that are coming out of the environmental humanities. So this term about the more than human is one that we are using right now to signify the kind of direction we are trying to take with our research. And we are um, still not very precious about the terminology or the semantics of those terms, but trying to also look at other ways that um, communities of scholars, other academics are talking about their work. So not um, always is the term more than human used. Um, we've also been looking at um, other ways of describing this um, type of new direction. And so I've been really um, interested also um, as, as part of the visit here at the University of Newcastle to learn more about the um, Alternative Futures Research Network and the collective work that's going on here because I think um, from everything that I've seen across um, the country at least, um, but also uh, partly internationally, it's uh, at the cutting edge of what um, we really need to engage with more seriously. And so that's why I'm very pleased to not also give this presentation, but also hear from you guys and hear from, from Hamed about the work that is happening here and the direction that the hub will take in the future. Um, Hamed has already mentioned that um, partly the seminar is sponsored by the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery through the Distinguished Speakers Program, which is a very nifty little program the ACM offers that enables me to um, go to places and um, meet colleagues and talk about the work I do and learn about the work that others are doing. Um, there is a bit of information about the ACM. If you haven't heard about it, it's probably by now the, um, the world's largest organization that brings together computing professionals. And so my research field um, at its core is human-computer interaction, interaction design, and we have a, um, a SIG, a special interest group, that is probably one of the largest in the ACM called SIGCHI. And um, um, that's the um, way that we are uh, affiliated with the ACM. Now, smart cities. I um, initially, when we started this work, um, didn't really refer to smart cities at all. It wasn't actually common parlance at all either. When I started my PhD in 2002, um, the kind of um, terminology that was used a lot was more about the information superhighway and the global village. And there were all sorts of different ways to describe cyberspace as something separate from the real world. So you would connect because you had a dial-up connection and you would, you know, um, be able to go online. These days, when you ask someone how often are you online, it's like they might look at you with a funny eye because you don't really separate between being online and offline anymore. You're always offline, you're always online at the same time, and so it's a much more fluent um, transition between the two. So back in those early days, a lot of the interest um, in the mainstream research community um, was around um, telework, e-commerce, distant education, the way the internet would bring about a global shift towards a global village enabled by um, uh, the information superhighway to enable us to sit on the couch. Now, I thought that the um, way that commentators painted a picture of the death of distance, it, something about it irked me. And so I started to look into the complete opposite, which was how the internet and technology networks could actually make a difference to place and how it could, um, I suppose, enhance or amplify place experience. So in my PhD, when I started in 2002, I actually started to get really interested in neighborhoods and how um, the kinds of new internet connections that were being putting in place uh, in various sites would make a difference to neighborhood relationships, to people um, forming place-based communities, as opposed to interest-based communities that were facilitated by online community networks. Fast forward to today, that actually happened to be quite a significant um, moment because um, we haven't experienced the death of distance. Yes, it's easier uh, in terms of mobility and aviation to get around the place, but at the same time, the internet has not really brought about what was um, anticipated back in those days, which is the, um, um, the kind of um, distant um, and, and telepresence uh, revolution that was anticipated. And I'll show you this little video that um, colleagues at MIT rendered. Let me see if this applies to the speakers. Yeah. This is a global mobility index, and it shows um, the way that rush hour kind of happens around the world as 
the, um, the timeline that you can see there in that um, animation um, runs across the globe. And pretty much all the cities, although they have all their own histories and geographic and cultural differences, they all seem to be going through a certain pattern, a certain kind of um, pulse, as they describe it here. This is the pulse of our cities, they say here. Now we're hitting South America, Rio Sao Paulo, going to North America, and the same, the same thing appears. It's funny and ironic that we have this very soothing um, music as the background track, although um, other research actually has been measuring the arousal rates of people behind the steering wheel and how rush hour traffic is actually causing a lot of distress in a lot of people every single day. Now, what is interesting to, to me is the kinds of immediate problems that we are facing as part of a globalized um, um, city uh, kind of development um, perspective. And traffic is usually one of the, the first ones. When we think about the issues in cities, we talk about congestion and we talk about traffic and we talk about mobility and maybe also transport, both public transport and other um, parts of moving people around. The other big problem that people seem to be associating when we talk about cities is urban densification. Um, as well as the other side of the spectrum, urban sprawl. So the debates around how to um, design cities to accommodate an increase in the population. Usually the increase in the population is taken as a given. That part is not often discussed. Sometimes it does get discussed, but most of the time if it does get discussed, it's usually independent of a lot of the urban planning um, scholarship and um, disciplinary background. And if it is presented as a given, the options are to look into um, sprawling cities or to look into cities being more densified with high rises. And now more recently, uh, maybe I think the, um, the starting point I would put around 2011, 2012, plus minus a couple of years, is the advent of technology. Now, technology has already played a huge part in cities earlier, all the way to um, probably the 60s and 70s, depending on how you define it. But I think the interesting moment that happened around 2011, 2012 is the arrival of ubiquitous computing technology that became much more sophisticated and affordable and what has in common parlance been termed the Internet of Things. To be able to have small little devices that could do all sorts of little things um, for cities. So the range um, starts from cameras that became more affordable to install CCTV video footage capturing for surveillance and for security purposes. Um, all the way to sensors that would measure um, traffic flows, pedestrian flows, um, air pollution sensors, um, and the list goes on. So it, all of those sensors produce a lot of data, and that is then um, possible to um, combine and analyze and mash up with two other big data sets. The other big data set is social media data, as well as all sorts of data that emerge from the transactions that we engage with on a regular basis, which is credit card transactions. If you have a transport card that has an RFID tag, that leaves transaction data as well. Um, and we are constantly checking in as well. I might be tweeting from a certain location. I might send a Facebook post that I'm giving the seminar right now. So I'm constantly leaving a trail of digital footprints behind me. Now, they are quite valuable for um, commercial analysis. The third one in that um, regard is data that actually has already been in existence and has been collected for a long time, which is what has been um, referred to as open data. So open data is what used to be closed data collected by governments, whether it's census data or it's data ca um, captured by um, local, state, and federal governments. But um, through pushes for um, open data, a lot of that becomes available um, and can be fed into the analysis. So the smart city is really founded on these two big pillars. One is the availability of ubiquitous technology in the Internet of Things, and the other one is the data and the opportunities for data analysis. Okay? So those were, um, I suppose, preconditions for giving rise to this term of the smart city. But 
only because you have those two ingredients or the whole bunch of kind of ingredients in your pantry and in your fridge, there's a whole bunch of different ways to think of recipes of how to combine them, right? So if you go into your kitchen and those are the kinds of things that you have in your fridge and your pantry, well, some people might create a very great, um, you know, blueberry cheesecake and other people might come up with dubious food. So what I think is um, quite important at this stage is to consider the options and consider the realities of what actually has been implemented. And I'm showing you this picture of the IBM control room in Rio de Janeiro because it's been used a lot to illustrate the kinds of um, ways these ingredients have been combined. And so now, what are the reasons why they have been combined in this particular way? Now, A, um, it is driven not so much by an academic or scholarly push, but actually by a commercial push. Um, my view of what happened around the time of 2011, 2012, again, plus minus a couple of years, is that we um, just came out of the global financial crisis and we started to recover, but um, smart people in the um, um, tech corporations and the big four accounting firms, they looked at their portfolio of clients and they've been doing pretty well because they have blue chip clients and they uh, go about what is called in other circles of our university uh, information systems and within information systems business process management optimization, which is where you use software and analytics to tell a business how to be more profitable and optimize things and run things more efficiently. Now the term um, productivity, efficiency, optimization, you will um, come across very often in the smart city arena as well. And that's not by accident. So um, one of the reasons why the ingredients have, have been combined in this particular way is because after the global financial crisis, there was a need to broaden and expand the market. And so the idea came up that we look at cities not as cities, but as corporations. And that's quite a profound mo moment in time because once you tell a Lord Mayor you're not running a city, you're running a corporation, you can sell all the stuff that you've produced in the 70s and 80s and resell it, regurgitate it to all those cities across the world. Because what you do is tell them that your traffic problem is not a traffic problem, it's a business process management optimization problem. Now that's handy because um, this is what we produced earlier. Here's all our old recipes of how to combine pantry and fridge items to help you deal with your traffic problems, your congestion, your air pollution, whatever have you. And so the tangible appearance of what happened around that time is this control room. At the time that it was installed, it was South America's largest array of screens. Um, so it looks like the JPL control center where missions, uh, robotic missions to Mars are launched from. But in this case, what we are doing is we are administering Rio de Janeiro. We're looking at all the different data streams that are coming from the Internet of Things installations, whether it's surveillance footage or whether it's sensor data. And these um, um, controllers are helping manage, maintain, look after, etc. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that um, that per se is a bad thing, although there's issues that we all um, come across, but it's very one-sided. So a lot of the potential for the way that these um, data pieces and the analysis and the technology um, provide affordances, they have been in a very limited way interpreted as a top-down kind of opportunity for us to do bird's eye view management. And that's obviously what a local government is supposed to do. You remember how a local government is often referred to as the roads, rates and rubbish? That's because usually a local government these days is associated with I pay my rates or my taxes and they look after roads, rates and rubbish because those are the tangible items that I associate with what happens in the city. So if I sit in a traffic jam and there's congestion, of course I want it to be optimized. If there's a way that it can run smoother, um, more smoothly, then that's a, that's a great thing to do. But there is more opportunity with regards to combining the technical affordances and the data analytics for ordinary citizens as well. So what we've been trying to look at is how you can combine this top-down view with more of a bottom-up view. Like what is in there for citizens? What's in there from a 
street level perspective. In fact, the early kinds of um, ways that we describe this notion is street computing, because we wanted to have a term that signifies how we are not just looking from above, we're also looking more like Jane Jacobs from the level of the street. Now, the other thing that irks me about a lot of the developments in the smart city space is a very technocratic um, instrumentality. So what's your problem? Congestion. Let's build another lane. Okay, there is no land for a lane. We just have you know, some sort of engineering fix that allows us to continue. Now, nothing against engineers. We do a lot of work with engineers, but a lot of the time engineering discourse is embedded in a positivist mindset that believes in a particular single origin of truth which in the humanities and social sciences we're um, trying to unpack and problematize. And so these kinds of clashes we um, usually use, again, as a source of inspiration and creativity, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully. But um, I think when you look at, for instance, the, the types of um, more positivist approaches, more technocratic approaches in the smart city, um, you would, as a social scientist or as a humanities uh, trained scholar, think, well, there's mm -hmm. other opportunities, there's other alternatives, and if you ask why four or five times, you might come to different conclusions. Okay? So why do we have congestion? Is it because there isn't enough lanes? Or is it because there isn't enough public transport options? Maybe it's because the public transport is not affordable enough because people are now jumping into an Uber and in Sydney, the pool feature is actually cheaper than public transport prices. So maybe it's a problem of regulation and policy. Maybe it's a problem that we are working too often and too long. Why are we getting to the city at 9 o'clock? Maybe a four-day work week would actually do much more to combat public transport and congestion problems than any of the kinds of engineering solutions to build more lanes. So what um, is very much in need in the smart, city, uh, smart cities discourse, I think, is more of that critical thinking that comes from the humanities and the social sciences to get at other layers and levers for change. Um, we had a panel discussion at QUT about mobility and transport, and we had um, the two major big infrastructure projects in Brisbane, our metro project and the Cross River Rail project, and both the, um, now the mayor of Brisbane at the time, it was, he was the deputy mayor, presented about metro, and um, uh, we had the CEO of Cross River Rail, and we had me. <laughs> and so it was a very interesting discussion we then had in the audience because these guys were pushing for you know, these kinds of investments. And I said, well, maybe we should look at universal basic income and universal service provisions and a four-day work week and see what that would do for our congestion problems. So um, you can imagine how that went, went down. So in our work in urban informatics, um, the term really came up for very different reasons. So if you Google urban informatics these days, a lot of the stuff is dominated by a North American discourse where you have um, research centers like at NYU called the Center for Urban Science and Progress that are doing exactly what I just described, which is um, identify data sources from IoT and other kinds of um, new technology you become and then engage in statistical analysis and a whole bunch of advanced maths to go about urban informatics. Now, our name originated in 2006 and it has a much more European flavor to it. So informatics in the French sense, informatic or the German word informatic, um, is actually much more about um, the use of technology more broadly. It's not at all limited to just the data analysis piece. In fact, when I did my PhD, as I said earlier, where I was going the opposite away from telework and distant education, the only academic community I could identify that I felt was a bit of a home for me was called community informatics. And no one in that community thought that the discipline or the group of community informatics was about data analysis of how many deprived communities and how many people in those developing countries and counting things and doing data visualization. So it's quite bizarre that this field of community informatics has existed for decades and has a 
thriving conference that's organized by colleagues at Monash University, although the conference is in Tuscany, which is a very nice place to go. And I recommended Hamid to check it out in one of the next iterations. Um, and then urban informatics has now been kind of come uh, across by um, NYU, by Warwick University, a whole bunch of universities that started to redefine it as being this data piece. This, this very much is focused on data analytics. So we've been thinking, well, and this is one of the struggles that I might share with you, and you might give us um, some advice on what we do about it, to either abolish it, the name, and come up with something new, or to constantly redefine it and say, we are urban informatics, but what we mean by that is our own interpretation definition that we came up with in 2006. So the way that we look at urban informatics is much broader. We have these three disciplines of or domains, let's say, the, the social sciences, the technical sciences, and the spatial sciences, if you like, people, place, technology. And then within those, there's a whole bunch of subfields. And really, um, the group becomes a bit of a um, melting pot for having um, sometimes, you know, very um, adversarial and, and uh, frictionful, if that's the word, um, conversations about theories and methodologies. But that actually is the source of our kind of... Um, creative energy, I think. So the way we look at it is that there's people, say, coming from an um, undergrad degree in urban planning, but they're really interested about um, figuring out what the impact might be of technology in cities for their discipline. So when they do their PhD, they would first research a whole bunch of stuff in urban studies, urban sociology, human geography, and so forth. And then they will also be exposed to the pointy heads in the lab that are talking about technology, IoT, and development, and so forth. And then they're trying to make sense of it all to take it back to their discipline of urban planning. And that pathway is the similar then for someone that comes from computer science. Usually that's the hardest because I get a lot of um, guys from Germany that are coming from engineering, software engineering backgrounds or sometimes even electrical engineering and so forth. And they um, sometimes have very preconceived ideas of what the world looks like. So it's much easier when someone comes from a um, social science or spatial science background. Um, but eventually, really, the group brings together those three main areas and um, is constantly engaged in each other's topics and in projects to bring about transdisciplinarity. So we call it transdisciplinarity because it's not just um, multi or inter where you get allocated certain parts but you focus on your own. Trans is really where you tra traverse, if you like, these, these three domains. Um, this is a timeline that uh, Anthony Townsend has produced for the Rockefeller Foundation a while ago, where they've been mapping um, the science of cities. So this was much more, um, I suppose, around the time that the, the urban science, which is another alternative term for urban informatics these days, um, came about. But you can see um, the video I showed you earlier with the globe and the animation by the MIT Sensible City Lab, so Carlo Rati's lab. Um, Carlo started around 2004, I started around 2006. Um, the um, CASA Center at the Bartlett School at UCL was already much earlier, but their early focus at the Bartlett was more on um, GIS systems and the way that data would feed into urban planning decision making and modeling. And interestingly enough, the original director, Mike Batty, has now published and has been, um, I think, uh, attributed as one of the, the founding kind of you know, thought leaders in the field of urban science. So then since then, and around the time that I mentioned, 2011, 2012, there has just been a mushrooming of these research centers and research areas that are also calling themselves urban informatics, but much more with the view of looking at smart city data analytics. So hardly any of them have this more critical approach. So I might have to steal Hamed's term, the alternative futures, and call it something around you know, the, the QT branch of alternative futures. We might have to have a talk about, about <laughs> that. I think that's far more exciting. Um, we do some um, retreats. This is like a picture of our group. So we got anything between um, 30 and, and 40 um, postdocs, PhD students, research staff, colleagues. Um, accumulated and once a year we also leave this big smog city and go to Kingscliff in order to come up with some new ideas and um, since 2016 we are part and embedded in the larger QT design lab which brings us um, in contact with the other disciplines in the school of design so that includes industrial design, landscape, fashion, 
interaction, visual design, um, what have I forgotten? Landscape architecture, architecture, um, interior design. The projects we do are quite domain driven. So they're usually not situated in any of those um, circles in the Venn diagram. They're trying to be across those, but they're driven by, by domains. So domains might be sustainability concerns. We've been doing projects around um, energy conservation and um, low-income households, for instance. Or we have been looking at um, living labs and innovation labs and the way that lots of local governments have started to embrace the whole startup and entrepreneurial kind of um, sector. And again, we've been trying to look through a critical lens at what's happening in those and been researching innovation spaces that are not so much subscribed to the usual discourse around creating I, what I call the churches of Elon Musk. Um, we've been looking at mobility, data visualization, and I'll show you a couple of examples um, just to set the, the scene. One of them very early on was at Fed Square. This is the uh, picture of the screen before Fed Square was refurbished. And um, we very early on came up with this idea of having a um, um, different applications to bridge the physical and the digital. So rather than having them um, thought of as separate to look at hybridity of hybrid interaction. And so one of the ideas was to be able to send messages, either tweets or text messages um, to public screens, um, urban screens. And so this is an application that we call discussions in space that um, in this case is a photo that was taken when Cadell Evans won the Tour de France and he came back to Australia to do his victory parade. And so the application was run for people to send messages like, will you marry me, and, and so forth. We also had this run when the Queen visited and when Oprah visited. So we had both the British Queen and the American Queen um, in our list of clients, which is quite fantastic. The um, interesting thing about these, these applications is that it allowed us to kind of go closer into that direction of situated community engagement. So I'll play you this little video which is an extension of um, discussions in space. That we call the Insta booth. And so following on from discussions in space, we thought it would be great if we had a portable structure that operates like a, kind of like a server rack, which sounds very technical, but pretty much like a scaffold. So the scaffold would be erected in different places in the city. And it can be fitted out with both analog engagement means and digital engagement means. So you can see that discussions in space is integrated, but you can also see people are actually drawing and writing. So we were interested in um, researching the different engagement channels and when um, would um, the one or the other be preferred by what um, kinds of um, study participants. And also we were interested in the way that we could actually create public discourse. So the way that people would approach the Insta booth and read other people's messages and then respond to actually have much more of a um, back and forth between ideas, between um, thoughts and, um, and creative input. So that was um, set up at various places for different projects, festivals, events and um, allowed us to, to study community engagement much more. In a more recent piece, we've now been also looking into um, how that can be applied to data analytics. So I told you how um, we've been quite, I suppose, um, critical uh, with regards to this IBM control room example. And so we thought, what can we do that exemplifies how it could be done differently or how it could be done in a complementary manner? And so my favorite example is um, this piece where we took data visualization all the way to the grassroots level. Now this is a picture of the cube, and um, that was the original idea, but the cube at QUT is a large visualization space. You can see in proportion to the people that are st um, standing there at the bottom, it's actually over two stories high, and um, it's very complicated to operate and run. And most of the time it's used for very predefined kind of purposes within the university. So we've actually taken a slightly different approach. And then we've been starting to work with food truckies. You probably have food trucks in Newcastle. Yeah. Um, they're really popular, not just by people in Brisbane, but actually by the local government. Because apparently there's kind of some um, 
internal competition of who has the most food trucks between local governments because <laughs> there's a bit of a food truck index. Like if you have the most food trucks, you're the most cosmopolitan city, uh, right? So apart from that, uh, the city council was very interested in supporting food truckies in going about their business. Now, um, we wanted to help um, with them as well. And we took a whole bunch of um, computer equipment from QUT, stole it, borrowed it for a day or two, and we actually set it up at the place where the food truckies congregate to cook. So there is a central commercial kitchen where they uh, arrive in the afternoon to start preparing all their food, then they load up the truck, and then they go out into the city. So we felt, why don't we give them the IBM control room? Okay. So we've installed various screens and data visualizations, and we created mashups just for them. So one of the mashups would be about when do postgrad students have after-hour classes when they finish class, all the retailers are shut, and so they had their class from 6 o'clock till 9 o'clock, which is roughly exactly the time people have dinner, and then they finish, and then there's just some candy in the vending machine. So we sent the food trucks to those locations. Um, another one was construction sites, when you know, construction workers are sick and tired of sausage rolls and, and meat pies, and so they wanted some alternatives. So we looked at construction sites, and obviously large events, when events are happening. The other thing we tried to do with the analysis is to avoid that they have the same cuisine in the same suburbs. So because before they were not strategic about their dispatchment, it could happen that you would have you know, Italian, 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 which is not you know, that clever. Um, and so we looked at the placement where they could, you know, um, talk to each other and say, okay, we're going to go Korean this time in West End, pizza goes to New Farm, and Vietnamese goes to Paddington. So this is just an example of how some of the top-down data layers can actually be translated into a much more street-level view, into a much more um, kind of pedestrian view. And that can be tailored to different, different contexts. So I've been... Um, Writing some of this up, uh, this is around the time that um, um, the, the Turnbull government released the Smart Cities Plan, and a lot of the kinds of narrative and the phrasing was about investment technology, and um, what was the third one? It, it, it really missed the whole narrative around people. Um, a lot of it was seen as a finance and investment um, example. Um, similarly, um, we've been editing this uh, book that is based on the Digital Cities Workshop, and it contains a whole bunch of examples around um, how people can reclaim um, the city for various purposes, whether it's for activism, whether it's for um, place-making purposes from the kind of um, urban guerrilla kind of approach, and um, it contains great um, examples of that work happening. And also, I mentioned the um, innovation hubs and the startup community, and so our kind of counterpoint to that is what we call social living labs, which is where it's um, not always based on the um, uh, assumption or the um, expectation that you become a startup, but um, the idea of being entrepreneurial is actually driven all the way back to just taking responsibility, taking initiative. And so that can happen in a living lab, and we call them social living labs, which is really just um, focusing on valuing local knowledge and enhancing engagement, but it's not to be brainwashed to become the next Elon Musk all the time. Now, I'm getting warm now, so I'm going to take my jacket off. That's been our work for um, the flavor, I suppose, of our work for the last 10 years, since we started in 2006 and roughly 2016. And then we started to kind of feel that um, we were, we needed something to respond to the climate emergency. Um, we started doing work on environmental sustainability very early on. Um, I think the earliest projects we had in the lab around sustainability go back to 2008. We organized some of the first workshops on um, environmental sustainability in, in human-computer interaction at the time at the Pervasive Conference in Sydney, uh, the Ubicom Conference in Seoul. But uh, a lot of the um, solutions, approaches, and thoughts were embedded in what I said earlier is just around optimization and efficiency. And so that lingered in the back of our minds and it came, became bigger and bigger 
like a kind of um, problem that you know is there that you really need to tackle. And so what we are trying to do right now is, is really problematize that problem in a, in a much more sophisticated manner. Now, a lot of this I can probably go through pretty quickly because I don't need to preach to the converted about climate change and the climate emergencies to anyone that needs an update on the kind of shit fuckery that we are facing. Um, so this is a graph um, which probably needs update by now where the red shows business as usual, the orange shows some small little, you know, farting around the fringes. Um, the um, yellow is maybe what we currently try to achieve under Paris agreements. And a fully decarbonized world would still get us into trouble the next couple of years, but then hopefully would, you know, create a stable, a stable um, um, carbon um, capacity in the atmosphere. So just to visualize in terms of exponential, some, a lot of the time humans have problems with grasping exponential functions, and this is one of them. Now, a lot of this is obviously not new. We've been um, there before. In the 70s, the um, Club of Rome has commissioned this report, The Limits to Growth. It's been debunked, uh, apparently, by a lot of um, people that it's interesting to follow um, their affiliation, their background, to, to understand uh, why and the rationale. There's also, I think, um, this which I find quite interesting. This is a um, commentary that was published in The Guardian about the fact that neoliberalism has conned us into fighting climate change as individuals. And that's exactly one of the problems that we have in design. So I started this section saying human-centered design or the dark side, or what's the problem with human-centered design? Well, isn't human-centered design great? A lot of people kind of say we need to actually move towards human-centered design. Now, that's true when you compare it to where we come from. So when we come from this technocratic instrumentalist view, where it's about gizmos and technology first, and then you compare it with human-centeredness, that sounds like a good option. And that's really what we were subscribed to for the last 10 years. But human-centeredness also means that the laneway will be built to um, make way for more traffic, because humans want it. Okay, so the way that Brisbane City Council right now is building laneway upgrades, the justification is that the voters will vote them in again when they build more laneways, and so they build more laneways. There's obviously another problem in that uh, elected representatives are not actually uh, engaged in evidence-based policy making based on um, science, but just on populism, because it's popular to build another laneway. Now, this article talks about the fact that um, even when you are um, concerned about the environment, about climate change, um, there's all bunch of things you can do to make you feel better and sleep at night. So I've started to ride my bike to work in 2008. I've started to try and be vegetarian as much as possible. I've tried to um, buy locally tailored clothes. Um, I've tried to obviously engage in recycling. I've got a worm farm. I'm um, going to show you a couple of pictures of how I started to modify my apartment. Um, but a lot of that is pushing responsibility and busyness to individuals so that they forget about other kinds of levers at higher levels. Okay? So I'm doing my recycling. I you know, return the water bottle into the yellow bin. I've done all these things. I'm very green. Well, the, the news is that we're still going to um, approach the end of humanity as we know it if we just continue on that basis. So all of these kinds of things are not producing the kinds of um, game-changing um, effect that is necessary according to um, the science. And we've published the, the first warning, the first scientist warning to humanity, uh, 2017, I think, was the second warning, the second scientist warning to humanity. Are you familiar with those articles that came out? Um, so there's, there's, there's thousands and thousands of um, scientists that have signed petitions and actually published articles that are called um, Scientists Warning to Humanity. Do, do have a look at them. Um, and there's a website where you can sign open letters and so forth. Um, so this article quite nicely sums up that um, it's part of the um, current capitalist system to push as much responsibility to individuals, which actually, um, ironically, still makes them money. 
right? So there is green options, and the green options are alternatives to conventional options, which means there's a market differentiation. So I can actually sell it and say, here, this is a much better thing to buy. And so you still buy, you still consume, you still fuel um, the, um, the engine. Now, one of my um, projects in the design lab, which uh, originally isn't really related to um, cities, is wombats. I love wombats, and I'm working with a wombat orphanage, probably Australia's largest sanctuary for wombats, um, near Canberra, in country New South Wales, uh, near um, Gundaroo, if you're familiar with um, that area. Now, why do I bring wombats in here? Um, Wombats are fascinating. If you ever have spare hour, like research wombats, they have cubic poo, they um, have um, backward facing pouches to prevent dust from going in there when the bomb is digging. Um, they are just um, like design engineering marvels. Now, the problem we are facing right now at Sleepy Boroughs, which is the wombat orphanage, is that they get inundated with wombats that are suffering from sarcoptic mange, which is a parasite that crawls under their skin and eats the wombat alive. Um, a colleague of mine that studies wombats um, from a more biology scientific point of view at the University of, of Tasmania was on ABC News saying that um, he believes the sarcoptic mange disease in wombats is the most agonizing disease of anything in the animal kingdom. Because it actually, um, it always causes death. There's no way um, about it. And it's the most prolonged death that you can experience as you get eaten alive. It goes over months. And so the wombats get lesions, uh, the skin cracks open, um, blowflies lay maggots in there and they get you know, further infections, they turn blind and deaf. They are seen during the day to try and feed themselves, they get disoriented, eventually they get secondary infections, they pass away. Um, the most humane thing to do for about 70% of uh, wombats infected right now is to euthanize them. But that doesn't happen and no one really has the resources to do so. Now how does this relate to cities and smart cities? Um, there is research, um, there's twofold. One is, this is what it looks like at a more advanced um, stage. So there's some research by um, colleagues that are mapping um, wombat sightings, both healthy wombats and wombats that are suffering from, from mange, and also other analysis that has been published. Now, one of the pieces that's interesting is that um, if you are a local wombat population, obviously maybe a little bit more than um, we have here, and I build infrastructure right through the middle, right? It means that these wombats can't visit their mates over here and vice versa. So um, they can't interbreed and it actually causes their DNA pool to be weakened because they're much more isolated within that local wombat population. Um, and the research is suggesting that if the DNA gets um, limited, the diversity of the DNA pool overall gets limited in that way, they are more likely to succumb to the infection and then to um, pass away from it. Um, so that's one of the problems with regards to um, land clearing, infrastructure projects, urban sprawl, the way that we go about nation building. That um, the human centeredness in that is that it's great for us, not so great for nature. The kind of um, response for more critical um, uh, environmental humanities people is obviously to say that if we take human centeredness genuine, human centeredness should be about human health, not human health right a second or tomorrow, but human health as in our connection to what sustains us, which is the planet and which is nature. Mm -hmm. So their argument in a way is that human centeredness is fine if we interpret human centeredness as what is actually required for human thriving and human health and human well-being. But that's not the case. Usually in 99% of cases, human centeredness is about what's convenient and comfortable for us. Um, couple more examples. That's the percentage of electricity used for everything online. So this kind of stuff that happens in the cloud obviously doesn't happen in the cloud. There's no um, um, kind of castles there. They are on the ground and they are called data centers. And they consume a lot of electricity, both for the computing power itself and then for the cooling that is required because all of that computing uh, number crunching and data storage produces a lot of heat. 
So that figure, um, when I first started giving talks on this, it was 3%. In the time that I've been revising my slides, I went, okay, 3 uh, So I'm up to 10 now. Every time I Google the latest, latest data, I should have probably Googled it this morning. It probably already up to 11 or 12%. That's, I think, a huge figure. If you imagine everything that we do, we are sending like container ships across the sea, aviation, you know, all the transport, all of that. And Google searches and that kind of stuff, is, is all of that amounts to 10% already. Now, this one here <laughs> is um, footage that was taken as part of an investigative journalism piece by the Washington Post. And this is a guy in the Congo who is mining for cobalt, which sits in my laptop, probably in your laptop, probably yeah. in your um, phone. Yeah. So lithium ion batteries require cobalt, and the Congo is one of the um, um, areas, countries with the largest um, export volume of um, cobalt that is used by Tesla, BMW, um, Toyota, Samsung, Apple, um, all the kinds of companies that are right now requiring lithium ion batteries. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, one, um, if we are talking about sustainability goals for smart cities, a lot of the time it actually translates into investing in IoT products. We need to monitor and measure and figure out of how much and where and blah, blah, blah. Um, at the same time, those devices that do require rare earth metals, uh, cobalt isn't a rare earth metal, but I'm talking about, for yeah. instance, um, the kind of circuitry components that are in IoT devices. They um, continue to deplete rare earth metals. If we're talking about batteries, especially for installing solar panels that are combined with batteries, we are um, continuing to um, increase sustainability challenges outside the city of our focus. So we might create this very efficiently run, um, optimized and highly productive idea of Newcastle, Sydney, Singapore. But at the same time, we're creating shit fuckery elsewhere. Okay? So a lot of the time, we are not taking into consideration the bigger picture of our actions and our policy decision making. Um, this obviously goes to production and manufacturing. This is child labor in uh, China. Now, if you've um, seen the Four Corners episode on ABC, it's not just child labor. It's actually concentration camps that have been set up in the um, uh, Northwest um, based on social credit systems that are enabling uh, Chinese authorities to really isolate uh, individuals and identify them and eventually just take them away. So if you haven't seen that Four Corners episode, do have a look because um, those people that have been incarcerated, they're not twiddling their thumbs, they are e engaged in uh, um, forced labor. And on the other side, because of planned obsolescence, a lot of these devices you can't repair. My phone, for instance, um, right on the dot, about a week before Apple is going to release the new generation of iPhones, is slowing down and is the battery is just not what it is. It's like really noticeable that um, all of a sudden um, a completely perfect phone is, um, is doing these things. And so that's built into the devices. And there's even now evidence on the table that they are doing this under the um, provision of saying that um, it would um, be better for the device um, life um, if it slows down. <laughs> now, we don't keep any of these most of the time in Australia. It gets shipped overseas, although there is some interesting recycling um, initiatives, but they are still very, very tiny and, and small. We would need something much more mainstream. I'll show you this little clip if we are good for time. So we are here at the Agogoloshi Electronic Waste Dump Site, indeed the biggest electronic waste dump site in Africa, I'd say. Um, this is where electronic waste television sets, computers, microwaves, refrigerators from most developed countries end up. Then you find kids, some as young as five, six, seven, eight, coming here to dismantle, to break, open uh, these electronic waste just to salvage metals such as copper. They sell these things to buy food, they use some of the money to buy food, and they give some money to their parents, and um, some would use part of the money uh, to buy whatever they need to go to school. The boys who are engaged in the burning, 
inhale the fumes that come out of it and that bioaccumulates certain hard toxics in their body. In our bid to ascertain that impact, we conducted the blood analysis of about 49 of these recyclers. The results revealed that the accumulation of lead in these boys are above the required standards, which is health threatening. Accra is probably one of the, um, the, the biggest sites. This happens elsewhere as well. A lot of it uh, might also end up um, just being dumped in, in the ocean. Now, the, um, the thing of, or the, the why, the pathway of bringing this back into the design arena, which is where we are situated in the School of Design, is around the kinds of decision making. And so we've been starting to have really interesting philosophical discussions about this because obviously as we graduate students from a design degree, they go into industry, they work somewhere either in a design agency, sometimes they're embedded creators working for a larger kind of um, corporation. Um, and they are obviously not stupid, they know that this shit is happening and they realize that they play a role in this happening, in the way that it gets facilitated through their design work. Um, so put this one up because it started quite a discussion in the in the design field around uh, this is Mike Montero talking about ethics can't be a side hustle and partly it's based on something that started happening in Silicon Valley um, which is that on Fridays people can sit on the beach and do a common good project you might have heard this where um, um, workers at Uber or Google or LinkedIn um, can offer their time on Fridays, usually on Fridays. Um, so they work on their normal projects Mondays to Thursdays, but on Fridays they can work with community groups or they can work with nature conservancies or they can do something for the, for the common good. And so Mike's saying, well, you can't have ethics offsets, right? You can't produce shit from Monday to Thursday and then try and offset the shit fuckery on Fridays. And so it sparked this discussion about, well, but what can I do? I'm a little you know, cop in the bigger wheel and I need to pay for food and rent and, and so forth. So one of the very interesting, for, at, at least from my observation, what I found really interesting in this discussion is that tech workers don't have a union. Not in Silicon Valley and not in Australia. So the union movement that would usually maybe be seen as the kind of organization or entity to deal with those um, types of issues historically has not really created a footing in the tech industry. So designers, freelancers, people in those kinds of professions, um, also gig economy workers, I suppose, are largely on their own. They talk to their colleagues, but it's different to actually being properly well organized and having leveraging power and bargaining power, not just for negotiating wages, but negotiating working conditions. And the working conditions in this case is about the impact the work has on the world. Um, so there's now some of these um, movements that have emerged that are kind of like a, like a union, but it's still very early days. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Now I'm gonna wrap up by looking at the last section, which is now, um, as we've now sensitized ourselves to these kinds of issues that we seem to be playing a part in, and so we kind of plead um, guilty as charged as well in that um, we do have a role in all of this. Um, we're trying to identify, well, what do we do about it? How do we imagine the post-anthropocentric city? And we had, um, Hamed and I had dinner last night, we were kind of talking about these things already, and he said, well, is it really the anthropocentric one that kind of puts the emphasis on all of humans? Like, for instance, the worker in the Congo that is digging a hole somewhere in the ground without any mining operations, just a, you know, a gig economy worker uh, mining for cobalt. Is he responsible for climate change? Are we pointing the finger at such an individual? Maybe not. Maybe we need to actually shift the emphasis not on humanity per se, but actually do identify how the ecosystem that humanity has created is probably more responsible. I mean, this goes back to that article and commentary in The Guardian that talks about how um, capitalism is always um, putting the consumer up there and saying, well, it's the consumer's responsibility. Well, you've opted to buy that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly here, maybe we need to actually label this the Capitalocene, which is um, emphasizing much more the economic framework this is embedded in rather than the humanity overall. 
Um, so what's happening in that space? There's a whole bunch of green projects. As I mentioned earlier, we've engaged in some of them as well. This is another project by Carlo Rati and his design firm in, um, in Italy. This is called the Urban Algae Canopy, which seems to combine a whole bunch of things. It's a, a renewable material. It's using natural sources from algae. When the algae gets exposed to UV radiation, the algae grow, and through the growing process, it darkens into a dark green. It can't be penetrated by the UV uh, uh, light rays, so it creates shade, right? The darkening creates shade. The oxygen created by the algae also is great for the city. It actually, um, according to the maths, is creating more oxygen than a tree. So, you know, let's have algae everywhere in the city. Uh, this is another um, project by Carlo. He's um, won this um, competition to de design this building that will go up in Milan. Um, and it will have a um, urban vineyard. So you can go around the building and there's a vineyard that goes all the way up to the top. Now, oh, fantastic. Um, when I um, took a master class, um, students into a master class in uh, Polimi, the Polytechnic of Milano, we looked at some of these projects and said, well, is this the future of sustainable building design? Or is this just greenwashing? Because it's like a signature vineyard attached to a um, building to make it look green and look sustainable, but who can afford a multi-million dollar apartment um, by a star architect? So there's a whole bunch of questions around um, accessibility, affordability. Does it actually have any kind of impact or is it just a nice little luxury signature project that is again presenting innovation theater? Looking very innovative but really taking us backwards. Um, I mentioned earlier that we started borrowing um, from other disciplines including the environmental humanities I'm not sure if David would say that he's an environmental um, scientist. He's actually a, um, a magician, and um, he's also trained in anthropological methods and ethnographic methods. So he's quite an interesting character. Um, I really enjoy this book, it, um, and that's where the term in the title of the talk comes from, The More Than Human World. So in his book, he gives this really quite um, engaging account of how he has um, traveled the world, and he's started learning again from the way indigenous peoples and First Nation peoples are um, caring for country, which is the term we often use in Australia, and also the idea of stewardship, which is um, that we don't um, own land, but we look after it. And so it goes all the back to very um, early notions of actually making a net positive contribution. Okay. When a bird eats some seeds and then it flies somewhere else and it poops the seeds out again, it creates a service for, for nature. It's actually um, contributing to the propagation of that um, a tree's um, seeds uh, to other areas. And similarly, obviously, I don't have to talk to you about the, the bees. There's a whole bunch of literature now that is developing in response to some of these things that are not just criticizing the shit fuckery that is happening, but it's actually also looking into what is the way forward. Um, so more than human worlds and the more than human is a notion that David used in his book in 96. He's by now published a couple of others that are um, very good as well. Um, and that's kind of uh, been used as a way to describe uh, moving away from the human centeredness to kind of say it's not just the human that we need to consider, it's the more than human. It's to decenter. Laura Folano calls it decentering the human. Um, Cohabitation, extension, sometimes ability beyond capital. Um, I'm happy to um, share the slides with you later. I'm just going to focus on what Laura has been um, proposing because that brings us back to the city's um, point. So how would we imagine a city that has not just the human in mind, but it's decentering the human in the design of cities where we look at a more holistic notion? So. If it's good for nature and the ecosystem, eventually it is good for um, humans as well. So we would need to really quite radically change our design approach to not just be human-centered in the old understanding of the term. We would need to look into um, making um, the built environment habitable for um, the entire ecosystem. So we started now scratching the surface on that and um, looked into examples. This one is um, really popular in Brisbane, which is fairy lights and trees. You got them here as well? Mm -hmm. 
And there is now calls for more fairy lights. I think at the end of it, all of Brisbane at night will just be illuminated. Now, we started to look into this in a more critical perspective and say, well, one, it's contributing to light pollution, which is um, causing a decline in the insect population, but also Brisbane is full of arboreal animals that are nocturnal, also called possums. And possums hate these things because they are nocturnal and they have big eyes, and so they can't occupy and use those trees as habitats. So the more fairy lights are installed, the less trees become available for possums to, to live in. In China, um, we presented this as a paper at the Media Architecture Biennale. The presenter right after us presented this. So it, I couldn't have imagined a, a more stark contrast between our messaging around light pollution and media architecture and the next person that said, I won this pr project and I've, you know, I've done all of this, an entire city is illuminated and you can see it from Mars. <laughs> Um, there's now more and more articles that talk about um, the ecological Armageddon because insect numbers are declining. I don't know if you've noticed, if I drive from Brisbane to the Gold Coast, my windscreen, sparking clean. No more dead insects on the windscreen. I mean, that's just anecdotal evidence, but it seems there's now scientists that are backing that up. Ooh, Now those are not insects, those are birds, and they're all about to die because a very human-centered approach installed a memorial at the World Trade Center at Ground Zero, and they had these high um, light beams that go into the sky. Now it happens that Manhattan is right in the flight route of uh, migratory birds that are migrating from Canada over Manhattan down south and vice versa, and they get trapped in those beams they're ex uh, expending all their energy, and once they are out of energy, they drop dead on the ground. Now, in um, response to that, the um, Brown Zero Authority, or the World Trade Center Authority, decided to switch off those lights during the time that those birds are migrating. But that is not always the default response to these kinds of installations. This is another one from Bristol, where um, the um, challenge was light worms um, that were in breeding season and they were chasing um, street lights and not finding their mates. And so in response they started to switch them off. Um, in the um, architectural world and built environment world there is different assessment frameworks for energy and performance and a lot of them focus on what's easy to count, um, which is numbers. And what is easy to quantify is usually energy consumption. Now, the LBC, the Living Building Challenge, which is this one here, has additional categories that um, buildings have to um, meet and perform in that are much more qualitative, like beauty, equity, place, um, health and happiness. It's not a very popular yet um, building performance assessment framework, but it's one of the first that is not just based on quantification and numbers, it's actually also based on um, qualitative aspects. Um, Michelle, who is the convener of the New Economy Network, um, her background is in law and environmental law and in um, um, earth law. So this is an example of rivers, uh, two rivers in India and one river now in New Zealand that have been given legal personhood in order to protect them, which is another example that um, I think is interesting in this perspective of the, the more than human. And then a couple of months, uh, probably a couple of weeks ago, we um, saw that New Zealand came up with a budget that was based on well-being rather than on just growth trajectory. So moving away from a capitalist growth notion to alternative indicators is important. Um, and I'll just finish up with a couple of pictures really, which is how I've just started to experiment in my own home. So I'm a hobby beekeeper and um, I've been looking into a whole bunch of ways that my own um, apartment in a way could become a living laboratory for cohabitation. So we are at the moment, in a way, cohabiting um, with uh, bees, and we put them into the um, flow hive that you um, might have heard about. So it's an invention coming from um, um, Stuart and, um, uh, what's his name? Stuart Anderson and um, Cedar. And so they invented this um, particular hive that looks like a long straw hive, like a normal conventional hive, but on the back of it, um, you can actually 
harvest um, the honey without disturbing the bees. You still would have to inspect the, the brood chamber the normal way. But when it comes to harvest time, the frames have been designed so that the bees can fill up um, the frames and um, the honeycomb can be split to create channels that allows the honey to drain without that you have to open it up and squash bees and smoke them and, and so forth. So the harvesting pretty much looks like this. There's a tube and the honey runs out and um, the bees still continue to operate so they don't get killed in the process. And they're not offended as well? Not really. Um, because they are um, European honeybees, they are waiting for winter. Now winter in Brisbane still doesn't really happen. So they're constantly going, winter is coming, winter is coming, like Game of Thrones. Um, and um, winter never comes. And so there's always surplus, surplus honey. This one here is a solitary bee. This is a blue banded bee that we have in our garden. We started to build habitat for them as well. It's, um, it's quite a funny little um, thing. It does um, roosting uh, behavior that's in this video here where they, before they kind of rest at nighttime, um, the males all bite into a twig and they hold their entire body weight with their jaw and they clean themselves from the day, it's like taking a shower after work, um, and then they go to sleep. So we've been filling up these um, basal bricks with a uh, mix of sand and concrete to give them um, habitat because in the environment they're looking for sandy riverbeds and they would um, go and um, build these little chambers there. We've got a um, nesting box for a possum. Now the, the brushed out possums are territorial, so they're usually just one in an area. And um, we're just adjacent to this quite um, big tree that um, is a habitat for possums. And it doesn't have enough um, hollow logs because they take a long time to form. So we've been installing these um, nesting boxes to see um, whether they would be accepted. And they are. See, this one is very happy. Um, at the same time, it gives us an opportunity to understand um, the crossover. So these are not pets. They're still wild animals, but they're living now on our balcony. So we can't really use the balcony during the day because there's a possum sleeping. Um, do we feed it or not? What kind of food? How often? Would we then all of a sudden um, create a dependency? So there's all sorts of design questions that are bridging into the ethical territory that this kind of intervention gives us an opportunity to, um, to ponder and to ask and to, to interrogate. And I um, find it um, quite fascinating to discuss some of this kind of stuff with, with colleagues because the, the opinions actually all kind of um, diverge. So here you see three interventions. The, the beehive at the top there is European honeybees. This is uh, sugarback bees or native um, Australian bees that are stingless and then the uh, nesting box is just there. So they're all in close proximity, but they all um, coexist naturally. And then, you know, obviously we are inside there. A um, couple of more readings. Uh, at that symposium that Hamed mentioned, um, uh, Stephen, um, I think, presented at the one in November. Uh, he's also published in the Green Agenda this um, piece called An Ecological Human Settlement Theory, which is presenting an alternative look or an alternative take um, on urban planning. So rather than the way urban planners go about, which is you're given a uh, number, like 3,000 people have to be accommodated in Brisbane every quarter, and then you do your thing. It's actually looking at it from a um, different point of view, which is food production that creates um, sustainment of a population at the same time for them to be making a contribution um, to the um, stewardship and uh, conservation of that area. Um, we've been picking up on the notion of slow cities, which is uh, an idea that comes from Italy, and how that can translate into um, urban design and smart cities. Slow cities are not just about um, speed per se. It's not about installing speed bumps and you know speed signs. It's actually more about the appreciation of life. So the busyness and the, the kind of speed of the way that we are rushing from one appointment to the other is, is more what is in focus for um, the slow city movement. And this is the piece about the light um, installations and the um, other kinds of impact that media architecture has on the environment, which is where we are pondering more than human media architecture. So this was presented last year in Beijing. and. Um, um, I'm pleased to say that that paper was so successful that the next conference made that the entire theme of the 
conference next year. So they're actually now focusing on a um, sustainability theme in result to us presenting this paper. And we've been running some workshops. This is a write-up, a summary about more than human participation. So we're also looking at different methods. If we are talking about decentering um, the human in design, we have to find different methods to go about this rather than having human-centered methods. What are the kinds of more than human methods? And you can see us wearing these um, face masks there as we are um, walking through the city of um, Hasselt in Belgium where the workshop happened in order to do a um, more ethnographic um, approach towards um, looking at cohabitation and more than human habitat. And um, the seminar, is, as Hamid said, is co-sponsored by NENA, the New Economy Network, which is a fantastic um, initiative by, by Michelle um, Maloney and others. And um, we've had conference now in Sydney, um, Brisbane last year, and Melbourne, and this year we're going to Perth um, from the 4th to the 7th of October. So if you haven't um, come across Nina yet, have a look at their website. There's a whole bunch of interest-based um, hubs and then geographic hubs. There's one hub here for Newcastle. Um, and so you can also get engaged in a lot of these discussions um, online as well as via these um, regional and um, um, interest-based hubs. That's all I have for the, um, the first part. Um, and then we got, as, as Hamed mentioned, more time allocated this afternoon to start unpacking some of these ideas. And I got some challenges there that we are currently working on, but we can also, you know, uh, since we're a small group, um, look into identifying our own challenges, whatever you'd like to debate and discuss and talk about. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions uh, first up? Where are the wombats from? <laughs> so this is at Sleepy Boros. That's the orphanage that we are working with um, near Gundaroo. Um, and I visit there um, every um, uh, now and then. And um, obviously there's some playtime that the, um, the adolescents um, are engaged in. This is where we were filming a little mini documentary um, that work doesn't get funding easily. So when we submit funding applications for wombats, people look up the cons uh, conservation status of wombats and say, oh, it's least concern, you don't get any money. Now, the fact that there is such a large proportion of wombats that are suffering from mange hasn't registered yet to, uh, to um, change the um, uh, conservation status. So a lot of the funding bodies say, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of other species that are threatened, they get priority. So that's also kind of part of the problem that um, nothing gets done until it's too late, and then once the species is already on the threatened species list, then they're already much closer to extinction. Um, in the meantime, we had um, a little bit of success in that um, Al Jazeera came and did another half an hour long documentary about the work. Um, so that's available online um, if you're interested. And um, Donna, um, who's the um, founder and who runs Sleepy Burrows, was selected by Animal Planet, the TV channel, as a um, dodo hero. If you know the dodo, which is the you know animal videos on, on Facebook. Um, so they have a series called Dodo Heroes, and she was featured as part of that, as the only Australian in the show. What do you think? Does it resonate with you? It does. I was trying to think of another question for you, but I wanted to tell you, that in case you weren't aware, that I was laughing to myself when you were talking about the um, cities becoming and behaving more like businesses. And we've just had a council that have just moved into like a new office building that they've built, um, and they've got like a penthouse suite up the top for the, the mayor and what is now called the CEO of the city of Newcastle. They've actually changed the name mm. of the mm. position. Mm. From like I, I'm not even sure what it was before. It would have been like you know the head of the council was over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now there's now we have the CEO of Newcastle. Some yeah. Some universities will follow suit. Yeah. 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 So I thought yeah, I was, I was really laughing when you said that. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. We we can understand that in, <laughs> in the Newcastle <laughs> context. Yeah. Mark was going to ask a question. Um, is there a hidden tension between 
are we really human centric or are we tech centric as a society? Is this push coming because we can, or that there is a demand from from people? Once again, <coughs> I. I, I I think, I think there is multiple pressures and um, multiple force fields. So there is obviously still a push towards buying more technology. Because if you're in the business of um, designing and manufacturing technology, you want to sell units. Yeah. So it, it still continues that um, a lot of the tech vendors, accounting firms, they're in the business of selling their items. So they're, I think, still... Uh, a lot of the time, um, technology focused and centric. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have, um, you know, the the engagement theatre that they put in place, where they say, "Oh, but we are actually, you know, very community engaging." Da da da. Um, but at the end of the day, their shareholders and stakeholders measure them on their performance, on their profit, revenue, profitability. Um, the other force field is the human centeredness, and sometimes that can be done in a more genuine manner, it can be done in a more, again, um, engagement theatre kind of manner. Um, so when um, local governments consult, there is a requirement for urban planners to consult the community in a certain period of time before, for instance, a development application is lodged, the different proposers need to consult. Um, in a lot of time consultation, and if you, if you get urban planners to talk off the record over a glass of wine, they will often tell you that um, it's just a farce. It's just a little period. We don't actually want any feedback. Yeah. So it's you know, advertised on the last page of the Mercury or the Courier Mail. It's advertised on some sort of little you know, poster that has been erected near the site. Um, but it's not really engaging in, in the way that we would look at um, community engagement where you actively want to work with the people going to be affected by that proposal. Um, so in most of the time, I, uh, you know, Brisbane right now, a third of the CBD is um, being ripped open to make way for a casino. Um, I was on the community consultation um, committee that the government put in place in 2013 for us to talk about, you know, at that time, it was called the um, Government Precinct Redevelopment Project because it used to be all government buildings. They've been all demolished. Now it's empty, and now they're doing this big casino. Um, so at the time, that decision wasn't officially known to the rest of the world. So we had this committee to talk about what do we want to see. People came up with great ideas. They said, why don't we have an extension of the cultural precinct from South Bank to come across to North Bank? How do we create connectivity to the Botanic Gardens? We got two major universities, Griffith on one side, QUT on the other side. Why doesn't it turn into something like Cambridge and Boston, where you have Harvard and MIT? So how do we increase this kind of more innovation precinct? Um, if you now go on to the timeline for the Department of State Development and you look at what happened, at the time that we were all in the room meeting every fortnight with finger sandwiches, the tender went already out to two casino operators. Mm -hmm. They had already made the decision that it's going to be a casino. Yeah. We were just wasting our time. Yeah. And that happens everywhere in Australia mm -hmm. and across the world. Yeah. Rangaroo is a good place, though. Point in case. Yeah, so if you look, there must be a lot of money changing hands for politicians to have those priorities. Mm. Um, and that doesn't get promoted at all in debates around urbanisation. We've had, the in Queensland we have the, um, the Crime and Corruption Commission that has started to investigate local governments and um, they probably need to go through a, a longer list, but they've investigated and charged people in Ipswich, in Logan. I think um, they investigated Morton Bay. They haven't touched Gold Coast and Brisbane, which I think would be ripe for an investigation. Yeah. Um, and also, I think just yesterday, the Federal Senate um, passed recommendation to establish a federal ICAC, um, yes, that's right. yeah. which obviously is probably not going to fly in the um, House of Reps, but at least there is push towards having um, such an entity with teeth to investigate such matters. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the, state, the president, New South Wales state president of the ALP just had to resign over secret Chinese property development. Yeah, I saw that, yes. Yeah, paper bags yes. full of money. And, yeah, it's still going on. I mean, we had all that brouhaha, you know, in the Gong, Wollongong and Newcastle, a lot of um, ministers and, and yeah. politicians yeah. were sacked. And I mean, the, the other thing to say about, about this, 
we are in the School of Design, but our faculty at Creative Industries has also a School of Communication mm. and a School of Creative Practice. And so we do rub shoulders a lot with people in communication in the Digital Media Research Center, and they do a lot of work on journalism and journalism research. Yeah. And I think the, the other kind of part to consider is that our public sphere and the discourse in, in, in the Australian public is obviously tainted by um, corporatized interests through News Corp. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at where News Corp is active and how the political system there is you know, shaping out to be, there's obviously some correlation that you don't find necessarily in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the way that, you know, they're not even overt about it, it's actually quite blunt. Yeah. that there's an agenda. If you look at you know, a lot of the programming on TV channels, newspapers, yeah. it's... Like to um, an Australian editor or reporter and they're towing the party line. Yeah. But also product placement. There was a really good media watch last week on um, you know, product placement, a lot of these reality TV shows, and you might have 27 products being placed in an hour, you know, which blows all the advertising guidelines. And again, you know, yeah. it's yeah. just a way of life. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I, the thing that came up for me um, listening to your talk is that, I mean, cities are really about production and metabolism between humans and, and labour. And that's often underthought um, in the whole process because, um, you know, we see cities as places all about residents and, okay, we talk about access to employment and that sort of thing. but. Oh, you mentioned business process management, management optimization, course, which is where production comes into the whole yeah, yeah. sort of story. But um, yeah, I'm quite interested in the work of people like Bernard Steigler, um, who's trying to transform, uh, yeah, the notions of the libidinal economy. Uh, and yeah, so I just wanted what your thoughts might be on that. Well, um, just yesterday, before I um, flew to Newcastle, we had a workshop on playable urban design. And uh, David Entwich, who's um, a um, urban designer and placemaker uh, and affiliated with the um, Project for Public Space, the PPS in New York, mm -hmm. he gave a provocation where he said that um, the way that cities have been indoctrinated to be places of production only really occurred around the Industrial Revolution. And the notions of childhood and old age or retirement also happen around that time. That childhood is an invention of that time and retirement is an invention of that time and the way that cities are designed in respect to that is you're too young to really you know be productive and you are too old you are you know wasted now for us so you're not productive anymore we're just focusing really on that middle period so the the idea and how he connected it to playful urban design is to um, look into not um, compartmentalizing playful urban um, interfaces, assets, uh, street furniture and so forth for child play and for playgrounds, but to look at the way that cities are not just about production. I mean, at the moment, the problem is that they are just kind of conceived as being um, sites of production. Yes, production does happen, but if that's all we do, it's really just the, you know, the very, um, I think, depressing outlook that we, we wake up to work. And then if I look at the kind of signage that is everywhere around construction sites, it's like entertainment precinct, um, sports arena, more precincts for consumption, shopping, mm -hmm. restaurants, cafes, more restaurants, more shopping. Um, everything is just about um, circuses and bread, the Roman philosophy of keeping people entertained if they're not working. And then you can have you know, um, smooth sailing in your, in your government. Um, whereas the... Um, the way of, of civitas is that cities are more than just these sites where we we sleep, we breed, we work, and then we eat. That there needs to be more to that. So I think it actually is far more reduced right now than it, what it should be. But it's capitalism that does that, of course. idea of the cities of the smart cities of more than um, human, to what extent do you see capacity in that idea to become a discourse and how would you define this? Um, well, I think uh, earlier I said there's, there's a whole bunch of um, different terms and I think the terms reflect a plurality of what people are working on. I mean, yesterday we mentioned this mapping idea of looking at 
a whole bunch of these different movements that are happening in order in response to um, you know what I um, now often call the shit fuckery that's going on, and so it's um, with regards to you know the environmental, the the labour, um, refugees, um, health, um, the list goes on. There's 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 a, a whole bunch of that, and part of the problem I think is that it requires more scale making or or building of scale in order to achieve impact of the caliber that we need. Um, and possibly what um, uh, could be called strategic essentialism, which is where, yes, we all acknowledge our differences, but we really need to come together um, in order to turn this ship around. Otherwise, the other side is just much more coherent in their narrative, in their messaging. It's just, you know, you want to make money. Yeah. And that's already summing it all up. So we need to find a way that um, we um, bring a lot of these um, very diverse social movements together, as you said yesterday, by still appreciating and cherishing their diversity and their difference. But if diversity is then seen as keeping us apart or causing um, factions to emerge, and with the factions, frictions, then we just get too navel-gazing and infighting without recognizing that there's a bigger picture that we need to address. I wonder whether if there's a big chunk of Australian society that kept outside of this discourse intentionally. Yeah, sure. um, and I hate to use this term, but it describes it really well. The working class holds a lot of uh, economic sway but unfortunately still engaged in high levels of consumerism. Um, and uh, without mobilizing a, a big chunk of the majority uh, into thinking like this or asking the right questions, the cities will never be smart because the people aren't, I'm not saying book smart or intellectually smart, but they're smart about the environment, about the future, about what is sustainable living. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if they're not engaged, but they're engaged and subscribe to certain channels that they currently trust. And so the, the kind of messaging at this very you know, hyper-local level um, does go back to, you know, um, the TV is on um, and um, Channel 9 runs and the, just the chatter in the background is already infiltrating a lot of um, families and households across Australia in a certain tainted way. And to such an extent that people would call all of us elitist because we are scientists, we are academics, we would, you know, already be ostracized as being like a bit kind of funny and weird, mm -hmm. yeah. which is more so the case in Australia as opposed to any other country that I would visit. The, the only problem is so, the TV is, is buffered by, by Foxtel and, and now Netflix, so even, even the TV itself is, is being, you know, there's no access to... To the, to the others. I mean, there's nothing. There's no connections. You anymore. don't even get the bad commentary anymore. We don't. We don't get anything. We don't. Then yeah. there are no bridges anymore because they, they've destroyed every possible linkage between the so-called elite uh, and and everyone else. So well, I mean, if if you really seek it out, you you can watch you know investigative journalism pieces on Four Corners on. Um, on Al Jazeera, they did the whole probe into Pauline Hansen's One Nation about the discussions with the um, NRA. Um, so if, if you know where to go, you can find these pieces. And I can satisfy my appetite for you know, finding out what's going on. But interestingly, the whole push towards privatizing the ABC comes from the fact that uh, we have such a warped system of the political spectrum that that is now seen as very radical lefty kind of crap. right? <laughs> If I compare this and contrast this with Angela Merkel, the head of the Conservative Party in Germany, um, and they are proposing to exit nuclear power, close all the coal mines, and phase out internal combustion engines, which is the country of the manufacturer of the automobile, right. right? If that was um, uh, introduced here, that would be crazy lunatic lefty stuff. <laughs> and here it's a uh, leader of a Conservative Party that is championing those things. So Australia's political sense is so warped to the, the right side, that what would be seen as centered in other countries is seen as completely outrageous, you know, communist waffle.
But that's part of, you know. But why? Why is that so? I still think a huge part is because of the way that, um, you know, News Corp is just very openly engaged in propaganda. If, if you look at the commentaries there, it's just seen as the, the, the mainstream kind of sentiments and um, it seems to resonate. I mean, part of the human centeredness in journalism is that you write what resonates. You not actually have a uh, journalistic ethical kind of standpoint where you say, I'm looking at everything that's happening as a journalist and I describe and publish what should be going out there. I go and publish what will sell more papers. And so you, um, the human centeredness in journalism is then appealing to um, populist opinions that are selling more papers. Obviously, there might be more, you know, um, links and corporate ties um, happening behind the scene. I mean, if you look at Clive Palmer and $60 million spent on advertisement for not a single seat won, mm -hmm. um, but preferences flowing to the LNP, um, and all the money spent on advertisement with, you know, those kinds of platforms, then you kind of put one and one together, especially considering the kinds of approvals he is now trying to push through um, as the second in line after Adani. Yeah, you actually have no idea. Yes. I would love to try and bring this up 